Chapter fifteen of part two of elective affinities. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Nicole Lee. Elective affinities, part two by Johann Wolfgang von Goethe. Chapter fifteen. Friends and relations, and all persons living in the same house together, are apt, when life is going smoothly and peacefully with them, to make what they are doing, or what they are going to do, even more than is right or necessary, a subject of constant conversation. They talk to each other of their plans and their occupations, and, without exactly taking one another's advice, consider and discuss together the entire progress of their lives. But this is far from being the case in serious moments. Just when it would seem men most require the assistance and support of others, they all draw singly within themselves every one to act for himself, every one to work in his own fashion. They conceal from one another the particular means which they employ, and only the result, the object, the thing which they realise, is again made common property. After so many strange and unfortunate incidents, a sort of silent seriousness had passed over the two ladies, which showed itself in a sweet mutual effort to spare each other's feelings. The child had been buried privately in the chapel. It rested there as the first offering to a destiny full of ominous foreshadowings. Charlotte, as soon as ever she could, turned back to life and occupation, and here she first found Ottilie standing in need of her assistance. She occupied herself almost entirely with her, without letting it be observed. She knew how deeply the noble girl loved Edward. She had discovered, by degrees, the scene which had preceded the accident, and had gathered every circumstance of it, partly from Ottilie herself, partly from the letters of the Major. Ottilie, on her side, made Charlotte's immediate life much more easy for her. She was open and even talkative, but she never spoke of the present, or of what had lately passed. She had been a close and thoughtful observer, she knew much, and now it all came to the surface. She entertained, she amused Charlotte, and the latter still nourished a hope in secret, to see her married to Edward after all. But something very different was passing in Ottilie. She had disclosed the secret of the course of her life to her friend, and she showed no more of her previous restraint and submissiveness. By her repentance and her resolution she felt herself freed from the burden of her fault and her misfortune. She had no more violence to do to herself. In the bottom of her heart she had forgiven herself solely under condition of the fullest renunciation, and it was a condition which would remain binding for all time to come. So passed away some time, and Charlotte now felt how deeply house and park and lake and rocks and trees served to keep alive in them all their most painful reminiscences. They wanted change of scene, both of them. It was plain enough. But how it was to be effected was not so easy to decide. Were the two ladies to remain together? Edward's previously expressed will appeared to enjoin it. His declarations and his threats appeared to make it necessary. Only it could not be now mistaken that Charlotte and Ottilie, with all their good will, with all their sense, with all their efforts to conceal it, could not avoid finding themselves in a painful situation towards one another. In their conversation there was a constant endeavour to avoid doubtful subjects. They were often obliged only half to understand some allusion. More often expressions were misinterpreted, if not by their understandings, at any rate by their feelings. They were afraid to give pain to one another, and this very fear itself produced the evil which they were seeking to avoid. If they were to try change of scene, and at the same time, at any rate for a while, to part, the old question came up again, where Ottilie was to go. There was a grand rich family who still wanted a desirable companion for their daughter, the attempts to find a person whom they could trust having hitherto proved ineffectual. The last time the baroness had been at the castle, she had urged Charlotte to send Ottilie there, and she had been lately pressing it again and again in her letters. Charlotte now a second time proposed it, but Ottilie expressly declined going anywhere, where she would be thrown into what is called the great world. Do not think me foolish or self-willed, my dear aunt, she said. I had better tell you what I feel, for fear you should judge hardly of me, although in any other case it would be my duty to be silent. A person who has fallen into uncommon misfortunes, however guiltless he may be, carries a frightful mark upon him. His presence, in every one who sees him and is aware of his history, excites a kind of horror. People see in him the terrible fate which has been laid upon him, and he is the object of a diseased and nervous curiosity. It is so with the house, it is so with the town, where any terrible action has been done. People enter them with awe, the light of day shines less brightly there, and the stars seem to lose their lustre. Perhaps we ought to excuse it, but how extreme is the indiscretion with which people behave towards such unfortunates, with their foolish importunities and awkward kindness? You must forgive me for speaking in this way, but that poor girl whom Luciana tempted out of her retirement, and with such mistaken good nature tried to force into society and amusement, 
has haunted me and made me miserable the poor creature when she was so frightened and tried to escape and then sank and swooned away and i caught her in my arms and the party came all crowding round in terror and curiosity little did i think then that the same fate was in store for me but my feeling for her is as deep and warm and fresh as ever it was and now i may direct my compassion upon myself and secure myself from being the object of any similar exposure but my dear child answered charlotte you will never be able to withdraw yourself where no one can see you we have no cloisters now otherwise there with your present feelings would be your resource solitude would not give me the resource for which i wish my dear aunt answered ottilie the one true and valuable resource is to be looked for where we can be active and useful all the self-denials and all the penances on earth will fail to deliver us from an evil omen destiny if it be determined to persecute us let me sit still in idleness and serve as a spectacle for the world and it will overpower me and crush me but find me some peaceful employment where i can go steadily and unweariedly on doing my duty and i shall be able to bear the eyes of men when i need not shrink under the eyes of god unless i am much mistaken replied charlotte your inclination is to return to the school yes ottilie answered i do not deny it i think it a happy destination to train up others in the beaten way after having been trained in the strangest myself and do we not see the same great fact in history some moral calamity drives men out into the wilderness but they are not allowed to remain as they had hoped in their concealment there they are summoned back into the world to lead the wanderers into the right way and who are fitter for such a service than those who have been initiated into the labyrinths of life they are commanded to be the support of the unfortunate and who can better fulfil that command than those who have no more misfortunes to fear upon earth you are selecting an uncommon profession for yourself replied charlotte i shall not oppose you however let it be as you wish only i hope it will be but for a short time most warmly i thank you said ottilie for giving me leave at least to try to make the experiment if i am not flattering myself too highly i am sure i shall succeed wherever i am i shall remember the many trials which i went through myself and how small how infinitely small they were compared to those which i afterwards had to undergo it will be my happiness to watch the embarrassments of the little creatures as they grow to cheer them in their childish sorrows and guide them back with a light hand out of their little aberrations the fortunate is not the person to be of help to the fortunate it is in the nature of man to require ever more and more of himself and others the more he has received the unfortunate who has himself recovered knows best how to nourish in himself and them the feeling that every moderate good ought to be enjoyed with rapture i have but one objection to make to what you propose said charlotte after some thought although that one seems to me of great importance i am not thinking of you but of another person you are aware of the feelings towards you of that good right-minded excellent assistant in the way in which you desire to proceed you will become every day more valuable and more indispensable to him already he himself believes that he can never live happily without you and hereafter when he has become accustomed to have you to work with him he will be unable to carry on his business if he loses you you will have assisted him at the beginning only to injure him in the end destiny has not dealt with me with too gentle a hand replied ottilie and whoever loves me has perhaps not much better to expect our friend is so good and so sensible that i hope he will be able to reconcile himself to remaining in a simple relation with me he will learn to see in me a consecrated person lying under the shadow of an awful calamity and only able to support herself and bear up against it by devoting herself to that holy being who is invisibly around us and alone is able to shield us from the dark powers which threaten to overwhelm us all this which the dear girl poured out so warmly charlotte privately reflected over on many different occasions although only in the gentlest manner she had hinted at the possibility of ottilie's being brought again in contact with edward but the slightest mention of it the faintest hope the least suspicion seemed to wound ottilie to the quick one day when she could not evade it she expressed herself to charlotte clearly and peremptorily on the subject if your resolution to renounce edward returned charlotte is so firm and unalterable then you had better avoid the danger of seeing him again at a distance from the object of our love the warmer our affection the stronger is the control which we fancy that we can exercise on ourselves because the whole force of the passion diverted from its outward objects turns inwards on ourselves but how soon how swiftly is our mistake made clear to us when the thing which we thought that we could renounce stands again before our eyes as indispensable to us you must now do what you consider best suited to your circumstances look well into yourself change if you prefer it the resolution which you have just expressed but do it of yourself 
with a free consenting heart do not allow yourself to be drawn in by an accident do not let yourself be surprised into your former position it will place you at issue with yourself and will be intolerable to you as i said before you take this step before you remove from me and enter upon a new life which will lead you no one knows in what direction consider once more whether really indeed you can renounce edward for the whole time to come if you have faithfully made up your mind that you will do this then will you enter into an engagement with me that you will never admit him into your presence and if he seeks you out and forces himself upon you that you will not exchange words with him ottilie did not hesitate a moment she gave charlotte the promise which she had already made to herself now however charlotte began to be haunted with edward's threat that he would only consent to renounce ottilie as long as she was not parted from charlotte since that time indeed circumstances were so altered so many things had happened that an engagement which was wrung from him in a moment of excitement might well be supposed to have been cancelled she was unwilling however in the remotest sense to venture anything or to undertake anything which might displease him and mittler was therefore to find edward and inquire what as things now were he wished to be done since the death of the child mittler had often been at the castle to see charlotte although only for a few moments at a time the unhappy accident which had made her reconciliation with her husband in the highest degree improbable had produced a most painful effect upon him but ever as his nature was hoping and striving he rejoiced secretly at the resolution of ottilie he trusted to the softening influence of passing time he hoped that it might still be possible to keep the husband and the wife from separating and he tried to regard these convulsions of passion only as trials of wedded love and fidelity charlotte at the very first had informed the major by letter of ottilie's declaration she had entreated him most earnestly to prevail on edward to take no further steps for the present they should keep quiet and wait and see whether the poor girl's spirits would recover she had let him know from time to time whatever was necessary of what had more lately fallen from her and now mittler had to undertake the really difficult commission of preparing edward for an alteration in her situation mittler however well knowing that men can be brought more easily to submit to what is already done than to give their consent to what is yet to be done persuaded charlotte that it would be better to send ottilie off at once to the school consequently as soon as mittler was gone preparations were at once made for the journey ottilie put her things together and charlotte observed that neither the beautiful box nor anything out of it was to go with her ottilie had said nothing to her on the subject and she took no notice but let her alone the day of the departure came charlotte's carriage was to take ottilie the first day as far as a place where they were well known where she was to pass the night and on the second she would go on in it to the school it was settled that nanny was to accompany her and remain as her attendant this capricious little creature had found her way back to her mistress after the death of the child and now hung about her as warmly and passionately as ever indeed she seemed with her loquacity and attentiveness as if she wished to make good her past neglect and henceforth devote herself entirely to ottilie's service she was quite beside herself now for joy at the thought of travelling with her and of seeing strange places when she had hitherto never been away from the scene of her birth and she ran from the castle to the village to carry the news of her good fortune to her parents and her relations and to take leave unluckily for herself she went among other places into a room where a person was who had the measles and caught the infection which came out upon her at once the journey could not be postponed ottilie herself was urgent to go she had travelled once already the same road she knew the people of the hotel where she was to sleep the coachman from the castle was going with her there could be nothing to fear charlotte made no opposition she too in thought was making haste to be clear of present embarrassments the rooms which ottilie had occupied at the castle she would have prepared for edward as soon as possible and restored to the old state in which they had been before the arrival of the captain the hope of bringing back old happy days burns up again and again in us as if it never could be extinguished and charlotte was quite right there was nothing else for her except to hope as she did End of chapter fifteen chapter sixteen of part two of elective affinities this is a librivox recording all librivox recordings are in the public domain for more information or to volunteer please visit librivox dot org Recording by Nicole Lee, Elective Affinities, Part 2 by Johann Wolfgang von Goethe, Chapter 16. When Mittler was come to talk the matter over with Edward, he found him sitting by himself with his head supported on his right hand and his arm resting on the table. He appeared in great suffering. Is your headache troubling you again? asked Mittler. It is troubling me, answered he, and yet 
I cannot wish it were not so, for it reminds me of Ottilie. She too, I say to myself, is also suffering, in the same way at this same moment, and suffering more, perhaps, than I. And why cannot I bear it as well as she? These pains are good for me. I might almost say that they were welcome, for they serve to bring out before me with the greater vividness her patience and all her other graces. It is only when we suffer ourselves that we feel really the true nature of all the high qualities which are required to bear suffering. Mittler, finding his friend so far resigned, did not hesitate to communicate the message with which he had been sent. He brought it out piecemeal, however, in order of time, as the idea had itself arisen between the ladies and had gradually ripened into a purpose. Edward scarcely made an objection. From the little which he said, it appeared as if he was willing to leave everything to them, the pain which he was suffering at the moment making him indifferent to all besides. Scarcely, however, was he again alone. Then he got up and walked rapidly up and down the room. He forgot his pain, his attention now turning to what was external to himself. Mittler's story had stirred the embers of his love and awakened his imagination in all its vividness. He saw Ottilie by herself, or as good as by herself, travelling on a road which was well known to him, in a hotel with every room of which he was familiar. He thought, he considered, or rather he neither thought nor considered, he only wished, he only desired. He would see her, he would speak to her. Why, or for what good end that was to come of it, he did not care to ask himself, but he made up his mind at once, he must do it. He summoned his valet into his council, and through him he made himself acquainted with the day and hour when Ottilie was to set out. The morning broke. Without taking any person with him, Edward mounted his horse, and rode off to the place where she was to pass the night. He was there too soon. The hostess was overjoyed at the sight of him. She was under heavy obligations to him for a service which he had been able to do for her. Her son had been in the army, where he had conducted himself with remarkable gallantry. He had performed one particular action of which no one had been a witness but Edward, and the latter had spoken of it to the commander-in-chief in terms of such high praise, that notwithstanding the opposition of various ill-wishers, he had obtained a decoration for him. The mother, therefore, could never do enough for Edward. She got ready her best room for him, which indeed was her own wardrobe and storeroom, with all possible speed. He informed her, however, that a young lady was coming to pass the night there, and he ordered an apartment for her at the back, at the end of the gallery. It sounded a mysterious sort of affair, but the hostess was ready to do anything to please her patron, who appeared so interested and so busy about it. And he, what were his sensations as he watched through the long, weary hours till evening? He examined the room round and round in which he was to see her. With all its strangeness and homeliness, it seemed to him to be an abode for angels. He thought over and over what he had better do, whether he should take her by surprise, or whether he should prepare her for meeting him. At last the second course seemed the preferable one. He sat down and wrote a letter which she was to read. Edward to Ottilie. While you read this letter, my best beloved, I am close to you. Do not agitate yourself. Do not be alarmed. You have nothing to fear from me. I will not force myself upon you. I will see you or not, as you yourself shall choose. Consider, oh, consider your condition and mine. How must I not thank you, that you have taken no decisive step? But the step which you have taken is significant enough. Do not persist in it. Here, as it were, at a parting of the ways, reflect once again. Can you be mine? Will you be mine? Oh, you will be showing mercy on us all if you will, and on me infinite mercy. Let me see you again, happily, joyfully, see you once more. Let me make my request to you with my own lips. And do you give me your answer, your own beautiful self, on my breast, utterly, where you have so often rested, and which belongs to you for ever? As he was writing, the feeling rushed over him that what he was longing for was coming, was close, would be there almost immediately. By that door she would come in, she would read that letter, she in her own person would stand there before him, as she used to stand, she for whose appearance he had thirsted so long. Would she be the same as she was? Was her form, were her feelings changed? He still held the pen in his hand. He was going to write as he thought, when the carriage rolled into the court. With a few hurried strokes he added, I hear you coming. For a moment, farewell. He folded the letter and directed it. He had no time for sealing. He darted into the room through which there was a second outlet into the gallery, when the next moment he recollected that he had left his watch and seals lying on the table. She must not see these first. He ran back and brought them away with him. 
at the same instant he heard the hostess in the antechamber showing ottilie the way to her apartments he sprang to the bedroom door it was shut in his haste as he had come back for his watch he had forgotten to take out the key which had fallen out and lay the other side the door had closed with a spring and he could not open it he pushed at it with all his might but it would not yield oh how gladly would he have been a spirit to escape through its cracks in vain he hid his face against the panels ottilie entered and the hostess seeing him retired from ottilie herself too he could not remain concealed for a moment he turned towards her and there stood the lovers once more in such strange fashion in one another's presence she looked at him calmly and earnestly without advancing or retiring he made a movement to approach her and she withdrew a few steps towards the table he stepped back again ottilie he cried aloud ottilie let me break this frightful silence are we shadows that we stand thus gazing at each other only listen to me listen to this at least it is an accident that you find me here thus there is a letter on the table at your side there which was to have prepared you read it i implore you read it and then determine as you will she looked down at the letter and after thinking a few seconds she took it up opened it and read it she finished it without a change of expression and she laid it lightly down then joining the palms of her hands together turning them upwards and drawing them against her breast she leant her body a little forward and regarded edward with such a look that eager as he was he was compelled to renounce everything he wished or desired of her such an attitude cut him to the heart he could not bear it it seemed exactly as if she would fall upon her knees before him if he persisted he hurried in despair out of the room and leaving her alone sent the hostess in to her he walked up and down the antechamber night had come on and there was no sound in the room at last the hostess came out and drew the key out of the lock the good woman was embarrassed and agitated not knowing what it would be proper for her to do at last as she turned to go she offered the key to edward who refused it and putting down the candle she went away in misery and wretchedness edward flung himself down on the threshold of the door which divided him from ottilie moistening it with his tears as he lay a more unhappy night had been seldom passed by two lovers in such close neighbourhood day came at last the coachman brought round the carriage and the hostess unlocked the door and went in ottilie was asleep in her clothes she went back and beckoned to edward with a significant smile they both entered and stood before her as she lay but the sight was too much for edward he could not bear it she was sleeping so quietly that the hostess did not like to disturb her but sat down opposite her waiting till she woke at last ottilie opened her beautiful eyes and raised herself on her feet she declined taking any breakfast and then edward went in again and stood before her he entreated her to speak but one word to him to tell him what she desired he would do it be it what it would he swore to her but she remained silent he asked her once more passionately and tenderly whether she would be his with downcast eyes and with the deepest tenderness of manner she shook her head to a gentle no he asked if she still desired to go to the school without any show of feeling she declined would she then go back to charlotte she inclined her head in token of assent with a look of comfort and relief he went to the window to give directions to the coachman and when his back was turned she darted like lightning out of the room and was down the stairs and in the carriage in an instant the coachman drove back along the road which he had come the day before and edward followed at some distance on horseback End of chapter sixteen chapter seventeen of part two of elective affinities this is a librivox recording all librivox recordings are in the public domain for more information or to volunteer please visit librivox dot org recording by nicole lee elective affinities by johann wolfgang von goethe part two chapter seventeen it was with the utmost surprise that charlotte saw the carriage drive up with ottilie and edward at the same moment ride into the courtyard of the castle she ran down to the hall ottilie alighted and approached her and edward violently and eagerly she caught the hands of the wife and husband pressed them together and hurried off to her own room edward threw himself on charlotte's neck and burst into tears he could not give her any explanation he besought her to have patience with him and to go at once to see ottilie charlotte followed her to her room and she could not enter it without a shudder it had been all cleared out there was nothing to be seen but the empty walls 
which stood there looking cheerless vacant and miserable everything had been carried away except the little box which from an uncertainty what was to be done with it had been left in the middle of the room ottilie was lying stretched upon the ground her arm and head leaning across the cover charlotte bent anxiously over her and asked what had happened but she received no answer her maid had come with the restoratives charlotte left her with ottilie and herself hastened back to edward she found him in the saloon but he could tell her nothing he threw himself down before her he bathed her hands with tears he flew to his own room and she was going to follow him thither when she met his valet from this man she gathered as much as he was able to tell the rest she put together in her own thoughts as well as she could and then at once set herself resolutely to do what the exigencies of the moment required ottilie's room was put to rights again as quickly as possible edward found his to the last paper exactly as he had left it the three appeared again to fall into some sort of relation with one another but ottilie persevered in her silence and edward could do nothing except entreat his wife to exert a patience which seemed wanting to himself charlotte sent messengers to mittler and to the major the first was absent from home and could not be found the latter came to him edward poured out all his heart confessing every most trifling circumstance to him and thus charlotte learnt fully what had passed what it had been which had produced such violent excitement and how so strange an alteration of their mutual position had been brought about she spoke with the utmost tenderness to her husband she had nothing to ask of him except that for the present he would leave the poor girl to herself edward was not insensible to the worth the affection the strong sense of his wife but his passion absorbed him exclusively charlotte tried to cheer him with hopes she promised that she herself would make no difficulties about the separation but it had small effect with him he was so much shaken that hope and faith alternately forsook him a species of insanity appeared to have taken possession of him he urged charlotte to promise to give her hand to the major to satisfy him and to humour him she did what he required she engaged to become herself the wife of the major in the event of ottilie consenting to the marriage with edward with this express condition however that for the present the two gentlemen should go abroad together the major had a foreign appointment from the court and it was settled that edward should accompany him they arranged it all together and in doing so found a sort of comfort for themselves in the sense that at least something was being done in the meantime they had to remark that ottilie took scarcely anything to eat or drink she still persisted in refusing to speak they at first used to talk to her but it appeared to distress her and they left it off we are not universally at least so weak as to persist in torturing people for their good charlotte thought over what could possibly be done at last she fancied it might be well to ask the assistant of the school to come to them he had much influence with ottilie and had been writing with much anxiety to inquire the cause of her not having arrived at the time he had been expecting her but as yet she had not sent him any answer in order not to take ottilie by surprise they spoke of their intention of sending this invitation in her presence it did not seem to please her she thought for some little time at last she appeared to have formed some resolution she retired to her own room and before the evening sent the following letter to the assembled party ottilie to her friends why need i express in words my dear friends what is in itself so plain i have stepped out of my course and i cannot recover it again a malignant spirit which has gained power over me seems to hinder me from without even if within i could again become at peace with myself my purpose was entirely firm to renounce edward and to separate myself from him for ever i had hoped that we might never meet again it has turned out otherwise against his own will he stood before me too literally perhaps i have observed my promise never to admit him into conversation with me my conscience and the feelings of the moment kept me silent towards him at the time and now i have nothing more to say i have taken upon myself under the accidental impulse of the moment a difficult vow which if it had been formed deliberately might perhaps be painful and distressing let me now persist in the observance of it so long as my heart shall enjoin it to me do not call in any one to mediate do not insist upon my speaking do not urge me to eat or to drink more than i absolutely must bear with me and let me alone and so help me on through the time i am young and youth has many unexpected means of restoring itself endure my presence among you cheer me with your love 
make me wiser and better with what you say to one another but leave me to my own inward self the two friends had made all preparation for their journey but their departure was still delayed by the formalities of the foreign appointment of the major a delay most welcome to edward ottilie's letter had roused all his eagerness again he had gathered hope and comfort from her words and now felt himself encouraged and justified in remaining and waiting he declared therefore that he would not go it would be folly indeed he cried of his own accord to throw away by over precipitateness what was most valuable and most necessary to him when although there was a danger of losing it there was nevertheless a chance that it might be preserved what is the right name of conduct such as that he said it is only that we desire to show that we are able to will and to choose i myself under the influences of the same ridiculous folly have torn myself away days before there was any necessity for it from my friends merely that i might not be forced to go by the definite expiration of my term this time i will stay what reason is there for my going is she not already removed far enough from me i am not likely now to catch her hand or press her to my heart i could not even think of it without a shudder she has not separated herself from me she has raised herself far above me and so he remained as he desired as he was obliged but he was never easy except when he found himself with ottilie she too had the same feeling with him she could not tear herself away from the same happy necessity on all sides they exerted an indescribable almost magical attraction over one another living as they were under one roof without even so much as thinking of each other although they might be occupied with other things or diverted this way or that way by the other members of the party they always drew together if they were in the same room in a short time they were sure to be either standing or sitting near each other they were only easy when as close together as they could be but they were then completely easy to be near was enough there was no need for them either to look or to speak they did not seek to touch one another or make sign or gesture but merely to be together then there were not two persons there was but one person in unconscious and perfect content at peace with itself and with the world so it was that if either of them had been imprisoned at the further end of the house the other would by degrees without intending it have moved towards its fellow till he found it life to them was a riddle the solution of which they could only find in union ottilie was throughout so cheerful and quiet that they were able to feel perfectly easy about her she was seldom absent from the society of her friends all that she had desired was that she might be allowed to eat alone with no one to attend upon her but nanny what habitually befalls any person repeats itself more often than one is apt to suppose because his own nature gives the immediate occasion for it character individuality inclination tendency locality circumstance and habits form together a whole in which every man moves as in an atmosphere and where only he feels himself at ease in his proper element and so we find men of whose changeableness so many complaints are made after many years to our surprise unchanged and in all the infinite tendencies outward and inward unchangeable thus in the daily life of our friends almost everything glided on again in its old smooth track ottilie still displayed by many silent attentions her obliging nature and the others like her continued each themselves and then the domestic circle exhibited an image of their former life so like it that they might be pardoned if at any time they dreamt that it might all be again as it was the autumn days which were of the same length with those old spring days brought the party back into the house out of the air about the same hour the gay fruits and flowers which belonged to the season might have made them fancy it was now the autumn of that first spring and the interval dropped out and forgotten for the flowers which now were blooming were the same as those which then they had sown and the fruits which were now ripening on the trees were those which at that time they had seen in blossom the major went backwards and forwards and mittler came frequently the evenings were generally spent in exactly the same way edward usually read aloud with more life and feeling than before much better and even it may be said with more cheerfulness it appeared as if he was endeavouring by light-heartedness as much as by devotion to quicken ottilie's torpor into life and dissolve her silence he seated himself in the same position as he used to do that she might look over his book he was uneasy and distracted unless she was doing so unless he was sure that she was following his words with her eyes every trace had vanished of the unpleasant ungracious feelings of the intervening time no one had any secret complaint against another there were no cross-purposes no bitterness the major accompanied charlotte's playing with his violin 
and edward's flute sounded again as formerly in harmony with ottilie's piano thus they were now approaching edward's birthday which the year before they had missed celebrating this time they were to keep it without any outward festivities in quiet enjoyment among themselves they had so settled it together half expressly half from a tacit agreement as they approached nearer to this epoch however an anxiety about it which had hitherto been more felt than observed became more noticeable in ottilie's manner she was to be seen often in the garden examining the flowers she had signified to the gardener that he was to save as many as he could of every sort and that she had been especially occupied with the asters which this year were blooming in immense profusion End of chapter seventeen chapter eighteen of part two of elective affinities this is a librivox recording all librivox recordings are in the public domain for more information or to volunteer please visit librivox dot org recording by nicole lee elective affinities by johann wolfgang von goethe part two chapter eighteen the most remarkable feature however which was observed about ottilie was that for the first time she had now unpacked the box and had selected a variety of things out of it which she had cut up and which were intended evidently to make one complete suit for her the rest with nanny's assistance she had endeavoured to replace again and she had been hardly able to get it done the space being over full although a portion had been taken out the covetous little nanny could never satisfy herself with looking at all the pretty things especially as she found provision made there for every article of dress which could be wanted even the smallest numbers of shoes and stockings garters with devices on them gloves and various other things were left and she begged ottilie just to give her one or two of them ottilie refused to do that but opened a drawer in her wardrobe and told the girl to take what she liked the latter hastily and awkwardly dashed in her hand and seized what she could running off at once with her booty to show it off and display her good fortune among the rest of the servants at last ottilie succeeded in packing everything carefully into its place she then opened a secret compartment which was contrived in the lid where she kept a number of notes and letters from edward many dried flowers the mementos of their early walks together a lock of his hair and various other little matters she now added one more to them her father's portrait and then locked it all up and hung the delicate key by a gold chain about her neck against her heart in the meantime her friends had now in their hearts begun to entertain the best hopes for her charlotte was convinced that she would one day begin to speak again she had latterly seen signs about her which implied that she was engaged in secret about something a look of cheerful self-satisfaction a smile like that which hangs about the face of persons who have something pleasant and delightful which they are keeping concealed from those whom they love no one knew that she spent many hours in extreme exhaustion and that only at rare intervals when she appeared in public through the power of her will she was able to rouse herself mittler had latterly been a frequent visitor and when he came he stayed longer than he usually did at other times this strong-willed resolute person was only too well aware that there is a certain moment in which alone it will answer to smite the iron ottilie's silence and reserve he interpreted according to his own wishes no steps had as yet been taken towards the separation of the husband and wife he hoped to be able to determine the fortunes of the poor girl in some not undesirable way he listened he allowed himself to seem convinced he was discreet and unobtrusive and conducted himself in his own way with sufficient prudence there was but one occasion on which he uniformly forgot himself when he found an opportunity for giving his opinion upon subjects to which he attached a great importance he lived much within himself and when he was with others his only relation to them generally was in active employment on their behalf but if once when among friends his tongue broke fairly loose as on more than one occasion we have already seen he rolled out his words in utter recklessness whether they wounded or whether they pleased whether they did evil or whether they did good the evening before the birthday the major and charlotte were sitting together expecting edward who had gone out for a ride mittler was walking up and down the saloon ottilie was in her own room laying out the dress which she was to wear on the morrow and making signs to her maid about a number of things which the girl who perfectly understood her silent language arranged as she was ordered mittler had fallen exactly on his favourite subject one of the points on which he used most to insist was that in the education of children as well as in the conduct of nations there was nothing more worthless and barbarous than laws and commandments forbidding this and that action man is naturally active he said wherever he is 
and if you know how to tell him what to do, he will do it immediately, and keep straight in the direction in which you set him. I myself, in my own circle, am far better pleased to endure faults and mistakes, till I know what the opposite virtue is, that I am to enjoin, than to be rid of the faults, and to have nothing good to put in their place. A man is really glad to do what is right and sensible, if he only knows how to get at it. It is no such great matter with him. He does it because he must have something to do, and he thinks no more about it afterwards than he does of the silliest freaks which he engaged in out of the purest idleness. I cannot tell you how it annoys me to hear people going over and over those ten commandments in teaching children. The fifth is a thoroughly beautiful, rational, preceptive precept. Thou shalt honour thy father and thy mother. If the children will inscribe that well upon their hearts, they have the whole day before them to put it in practice. But the sixth now, what can we say to that? Thou shalt do no murder, as if any man ever felt the slightest general inclination to strike another man dead. Men will hate sometimes, they will fly into passions and forget themselves, and as a consequence of this, or other feelings, it may easily come now and then to a murder. But what a barbarous precaution it is to tell children that they are not to kill or murder! If the commandment ran, have a regard for the life of another. Put away whatever can do him hurt. Save him, though with peril to yourself. If you injure him, consider that you are injuring yourself. That is the form which should be in use among educated, reasonable people. And in our catechism teaching, we have only an awkward, clumsy way of sliding into it through a... What do you mean by that? And as for the seventh, that is utterly detestable. What? To stimulate the precocious curiosity of children to pry into dangerous mysteries to obtrude violently upon their imaginations, ideas, and notions, which beyond all things you should wish to keep from them. It were far better if such actions as that commandment speaks of were dealt with arbitrarily by some secret tribunal than prated openly of before church and congregation. At this moment, Ottilie entered the room. Thou shalt not commit adultery. Mittler went on. How coarse! How brutal! What a different sound it has if you let it run! Thou shalt hold in reverence the bond of marriage. When thou seest a husband and a wife between whom there is true love, thou shalt rejoice in it, and their happiness shall gladden thee like the cheerful light of a beautiful day. If there arise anything to make division between them, thou shalt use thy best endeavour to clear it away. Thou shalt labour to pacify them and to soothe them, to show each of them the excellencies of the other. Thou shalt not think of thyself, but purely and disinterestedly thou shalt seek to further the well-being of others and make them feel what a happiness is that which arises out of all duty done, and especially out of that duty which holds man and wife indissolubly bound together. Charlotte felt as if she was sitting on hot coals. The situation was the more distressing, as she was convinced that Mittler was not thinking the least where he was or what he was saying, and before she was able to interrupt him, she saw Ottilie, after changing colour painfully for a few seconds, rise and leave the room. Charlotte constrained herself to seem unembarrassed, you will leave us the eighth commandment she said with a faint smile all the rest replied mittler if i may only insist first on the foundation of the whole of them at this moment nanny rushed in screaming and crying she's dying the young lady's dying come to her come ottilie had found her way back with extreme difficulty to her own room the beautiful things which she was to wear the next day were laid out on a number of chairs and the girl who had been running from one to the other staring at them and admiring them called out in her ecstasy look dearest madam only look there's a bridal dress worthy of you ottilie heard the word and sank upon the sofa nanny saw her mistress turn pale fall back and faint she ran for charlotte who came the medical friend was on the spot in a moment he thought it was nothing but exhaustion he ordered some strong soup to be brought ottilie refused it with an expression of loathing it almost threw her into convulsions when they put the cup to her lips a light seemed to break on the physician he asked hastily and anxiously what Ottilie had taken that day. The little girl hesitated. He repeated his question, and she then acknowledged that Ottilie had taken nothing. There was a nervousness of manner about Nanny which made him suspicious. He carried her with him into the adjoining room. Charlotte followed, and the girl threw herself on her knees and confessed that for a long time past Ottilie had taken as good as nothing. At her mistress' urgent request she had herself eaten the food which had been brought for her, she had said nothing about it, because Ottilie had by signs alternately begged her not to tell any one, and threatened her if she did, and, as she innocently added, because it was so nice. The Major and Mittler now came up as well. They found Charlotte busy with the physician. The pale, beautiful girl was sitting, apparently conscious, in the corner of the sofa. 
they had begged her to lie down she had declined to do this but she made signs to have her box brought and resting her feet upon it placed herself in an easy half recumbent position she seemed to be wishing to take leave and by her gestures was expressing to all about her the tenderest affection love gratitude entreaties for forgiveness and the most heartfelt farewell edward on alighting from his horse was informed of what had happened he rushed to the room threw himself down at her side and seizing her hand deluged it with silent tears in this position he remained a long time at last he called out and am i never more to hear your voice will you not turn back toward life to give me one single word well then very well i will follow you yonder and there we will speak in another language she pressed his hand with all the strength she had she gazed at him with a glance full of life and full of love and drawing a long breath and for a little while moving her lips inarticulately with a tender effort of affection she called out promise me to live and then fell back immediately i promise i promise he cried to her but he cried only after her she was already gone after a miserable night the care of providing for the loved remains fell upon charlotte the major and mittler assisted her edward's condition was utterly pitiable his first thought when he was in any degree recovered from his despair and able to collect himself was that ottilie should not be carried out of the castle she should be kept there and attended upon as if she were alive for she was not dead it was impossible that she should be dead they did what he desired at least so far as that they did not do what he had forbidden he did not ask to see her there was now a second alarm and a further cause for anxiety nanny who had been spoken to sharply by the physician had been compelled by threats to confess and after her confession had been overwhelmed with reproaches had now disappeared after a long search she was found but she appeared to be out of her mind her parents took her home but the gentlest treatment had no effect upon her and she had to be locked up for fear she should run away again they succeeded by degrees in recovering edward from the extreme agony of despair but only to make him more really wretched he now saw clearly he could not doubt now that the happiness of his life was gone from him for ever it was suggested to him that if ottilie was placed in the chapel she would still remain among the living and it would be a calm quiet peaceful home for her there was much difficulty in obtaining his consent he would only give it under condition that she should be taken there in an open coffin that the vault in which she was laid if covered at all should be only covered with glass and a lamp should be kept always burning there it was arranged that this should be done and then he seemed resigned they clothed the delicate body in the festal dress which she had herself prepared a garland of asters was wreathed about her head which shone sadly there like melancholy stars to decorate the bier in the church and chapel the gardens were robbed of their beauty they lay desolate as if a premature winter had blighted all their loveliness in the earliest morning she was born in an open coffin out of the castle and the heavenly features were once more reddened with the rising sun the mourners crowded about her as she was being taken along none would go before none would follow everyone would be where she was everyone would enjoy her presence for the last time men and women and little boys there was not one unmoved least of all to be consoled were the girls who felt most immediately what they had lost nanny was not present it had been thought better not to allow it and they had kept secret from her the day and the hour of the funeral she was at her parents house closely watched in a room looking towards the garden but when she heard the bells tolling she knew too well what they meant and her attendant having left her out of curiosity to see the funeral she escaped out of the window into a passage and from thence finding all the doors locked into an upper open loft at this moment the funeral was passing through the village which had been all freshly strewed with leaves nanny saw her mistress plainly close below her more plainly more entirely than any one in the procession underneath she appeared to be lifted above the earth borne as it were on clouds or waves and the girl fancied she was making signs to her her senses swam she tottered swayed herself for a moment on the edge and fell to the ground the crowd fell asunder on all sides with a cry of horror in the tumult and confusion the bearers were obliged to set down the coffin the girl lay close by it it seemed as if every limb was broken they lifted her up and by accident or providentially she was allowed to lean over the body she appeared indeed to be endeavouring with what remained to her of life to reach her beloved mistress scarcely however had the loosely hanging limbs touched ottilie's robe and the parlous finger rested on the folded hands 
then the girl started up and first raising her arms and eyes towards heaven flung herself down upon her knees before the coffin and gazed with passionate devotion at her mistress at last she sprang as if inspired from off the ground and cried with a voice of ecstasy yes she has forgiven me what no man what i myself could never have forgiven god forgives me through her look her motion her lips now she is lying again so still and quiet but you saw how she raised herself up and unfolded her hands and blessed me and how kindly she looked at me you all heard you can witness that she said to me you are forgiven i am not a murderess any more she has forgiven me god has forgiven me and no one may now say anything more against me the people stood crowding around her they were amazed they listened and looked this way and that and no one knew what should next be done bear her on to her rest said the girl she has done her part she has suffered and cannot now remain any more among us the bier moved on nanny now following it and thus they reached the church and the chapel so now stood the coffin of ottilie with the child's coffin at her head and her box at her feet enclosed in a resting place of massive oak a woman had been provided to watch the body for the first part of the time as it lay there so beautifully beneath its glass covering but nanny would not permit this duty to be taken from herself she would remain alone without a companion and attend to the lamp which was now kindled for the first time and she begged to be allowed to do it with so much eagerness and perseverance that they let her have her way to prevent any greater evil that might ensue but she did not long remain alone as night was falling and the hanging lamp began to exercise its full right and shed abroad a larger lustre the door opened and the architect entered the chapel the chastely ornamented walls in the mild light looked more strange more awful more antique than he was prepared to see them nanny was sitting on one side of the coffin she recognised him immediately but she pointed in silence to the pale form of her mistress and there stood he on the other side in the vigour of youth and of grace with his arms drooping and his hands clasped piteously together motionless with head and eye inclined over the inanimate body once already he had stood thus before in the belisarius he had now involuntarily fallen into the same attitude and this time how naturally here too was something of inestimable worth thrown down from its high estate there were courage prudence power rank and wealth in one single man lost irrevocably there were qualities which in decisive moments had been of indispensable service to the nation and the prince but which when the moment was past were no more valued but flung aside and neglected and cared for no longer and here were many other silent virtues which had been summoned but a little time before by nature out of the depths of her treasures and now swept rapidly away again by her callous hand rare sweet lovely virtues whose peaceful workings the thirsty world had welcomed while it had them with gladness and joy and now was sorrowing for them in unveiling desire both the youth and the girl were silent for a long time but when she saw the tears streaming fast down his cheeks and he appeared to be sinking under the burden of his sorrow she spoke to him with so much truthfulness and power with such kindness and such confidence that astonished at the flow of her words he was able to recover himself and he saw his beautiful friend floating before him in the new life of a higher world his tears ceased flowing his sorrow grew lighter on his knees he took leave of ottilie and with a warm pressure of the hand of nanny he rode away from the spot into the night without having seen a single other person the surgeon had without the girl being aware of it remained all night in the church and when he went in the morning to see her he found her cheerful and tranquil he was prepared for wild aberrations he thought that she would be sure to speak to him of conversations which she had held in the night with ottilie and of other such apparitions but she was natural quiet and perfectly self-possessed she remembered accurately what had happened in her previous life she could describe the circumstances of it with the greatest exactness and never in anything which she said stepped out of the course of what was real and natural except in her account of what had passed with the body which she delighted to repeat again and again how ottilie had raised herself up had blessed her had forgiven her and thereby set her at rest for ever ottilie remained so long in her beautiful state which more resembles sleep than death that a number of persons were attracted there to look at her the neighbours and the villagers wished to see her again and every one desired to hear nanny's incredible story from her own mouth many laughed at it most doubted and some few were found who were able to believe difficulties for which no real satisfaction is attainable compel us to faith before the eyes of all the world nanny's limbs had been broken and by touching the sacred body she had been restored to strength again why should not others find similar good fortune 
delicate mothers first privately brought their children who were suffering from obstinate disorders and they believed that they could trace an immediate improvement the confidence of the people increased and at last there was no one so old or so weak as not to have come to seek fresh life and health and strength at this place the concourse became so great that they were obliged except at the hours of divine service to keep the church and chapel closed edward did not venture to look at her again he lived on mechanically he seemed to have no tears left and to be incapable of any further suffering his power of taking interest in what was going on diminished every day his appetite gradually failed the only refreshment which did him any good was what he drank out of the glass which to him indeed had been but an untrue prophet he continued to gaze at the intertwining initials and the earnest cheerfulness of his expression seemed to signify that he still hoped to be united with her at last and as every little circumstance combines to favour the unfortunate and every accident contributes to elate him so do the most trifling occurrences love to unite to crush and overwhelm the unhappy one day as edward raised the beloved glass to his lips he put it down and thrust it from him with a shudder it was the same and not the same he missed a little private mark upon it the valet was questioned and had to confess that the real glass had not long since been broken and that one like it belonging to the same set had been substituted in its place edward could not be angry his destiny had spoken out with sufficient clearness in the fact and how should he be affected by the shadow and yet it touched him deeply he seemed now to dislike drinking and thenceforward purposely to abstain from food and from speaking but from time to time a sort of restlessness came over him he would desire to eat and drink something and would begin again to speak ah he said one day to the major who now seldom left his side how unhappy i am that all my efforts are but imitations ever and false and fruitless what was blessedness to her is pain to me and yet for the sake of this blessedness i am forced to take this pain upon myself i must go after her follow her by the same road but my nature and my promise hold me back it is a terrible difficulty indeed to imitate the inimitable i feel clearly my dear friend that genius is required for everything for martyrdom as well as the rest what shall we say of the endeavours which in this hopeless condition were made for him his wife his friends his physician incessantly laboured to do something for him but it was all in vain at last they found him dead mittler was the first to make the melancholy discovery he called the physician and examined closely with his usual presence of mind the circumstances under which he had been found charlotte rushed into them she was afraid that he had committed suicide and accused herself and accused others of unpardonable carelessness but the physician on natural and mittler on moral grounds was soon able to satisfy her of the contrary it was quite clear that edward's end had taken him by surprise in a quiet moment he had taken out of his pocket-book and out of a casket everything which remained to him as memorials of ottilie and had spread them out before him a lock of hair flowers which had been gathered in some happy hour and every letter which she had written to him from the first which his wife had ominously happened to give him it was impossible that he would intentionally have exposed these to the danger of being seen by the first person who might happen to discover him but so lay the heart which but a short time before had been so swift and eager at rest now where it could never be disturbed and falling asleep as he did with his thoughts on one so saintly he might well be called blessed charlotte gave him his place at ottilie's side and arranged that henceforth no other person should be placed with them in the same vault in order to secure this she made it a condition under which she settled considerable sums of money on the church and the school so lie the lovers sleeping side by side peace hovers above their resting-place fair angel faces gaze down upon them from the vaulted ceiling and what a happy moment that will be when one day they wake again together end of chapter eighteen end of elective affinities by johann wolfgang von goethe